So I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, <clears throat> as everyone knows, this is part of our virtual town hall series that we do at Washingtonians for Public Banking. Um, we perform these town hall series every two, every other month, so every two months, um, to help to help to help educate the public about public banking and bank reform issues. My name is Marco Rosario Rossi. I'm the executive director for Washingtonians for Public Banking, and this month we have a real treat. We have Ellen Brown, who is the author of numerous books on public banking and banking reform, including the what I would say is the classic in the public banking movement, the public bank solution from austerity to pro prosperity. Um, she is going to be presenting on the past, present, and future of public banking here in Washington. How this will go is that we will have roughly about 45 to 50 minutes of presentation, and then we will have about 15 to 10 minutes of question and answers afterwards. Um, I'm really excited to hear the response from everyone who's uh, going to participate today. If we do go over the hour, I just want people to know that's fine. Uh, we're not pressed for time, um, but do be advised when you ask questions to keep them concise and uh, so that we can adequately answer it and make sure there's uh, enough time for everybody. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome Ellen Brown as our presenter for this month. Glad to have you, Ellen. Thank you very much. Let me just pull up my screen here. Okay, so I'm, uh, as Marco said, I'm uh, going to talk on the past, present, and future of public banking. Actually, I didn't go into the past too much, but <clears throat> I could do that later if you care. Uh, so public banking is not a new idea. Uh, worldwide, there are 910 public banks, that plus their branches, of course, with total combined assets of nearly $50 trillion dollars. And nearly 35 trillion are in the Far East and Central Asia, maybe mainly China. Uh, China was one of the poorest countries in the world and moved up to global economic powerhouse in four decades. Among, among other achievements, China built 26,000 miles of high speed rail in 15 years, along with the world's largest dam and power station. How did they fund all that? Uh, that their secret is the government owns 80% of banking assets, including three massive development banks. The biggest is China Development Bank. Uh, and the government, or the, so the banks do what all banks do, which is issue money as credit and then on their books. And then the uh, fees from the trains or the, the dam pay back the loans. So the secret, of course, of course is to, uh, create productive things that can generate fees that can actually pay back those loans. <clears throat> um, over twenty over the over twenty three years, China's money supply actually grew eighteen hundred percent. That's by a factor of eighteen, and yet prices didn't go up. So that's pretty remarkable. I mean, they added all that money to the system, and as I'll show later, the money comes from deposits created by banks and their books, uh, <clears throat> but. It wasn't inflationary, and why was that? Because supply went up along with demand. Uh, GDP shot up as well. So if you have like, say you have ten dollars and ten widgets, ten dollars chasing after ten widgets, the price will be a dollar a widget. If then if you have a hundred dollars chasing after ten widgets, like you pour money into the system, but you don't change the widgets, then the price is going to be ten dollars a widget. But if you take your $100 and you make 100 widgets, then the price is going to be $1 a widget. So that's the secret, I would say, to inflation. <laughs> Increase productivity, not try to um, you know, strangle the money supply as, be, as is happening now. <clears throat> um, so China has had problems, but it's not due to its publicly owned banks. It's the main problem was the collapse of its property, property market which was primarily funded by private corporate debt. They also had other problems like their population is declining and they had very strict COVID lockdowns, which affected business. <clears throat> we only in the US have one <laughs> a publicly owned bank and that's the Bank of North Dakota, but it's a stellar model and it's 
kind of what got this whole public banking movement uh, set off after, well, what really set it off was um, Occupy Wall Street, where the idea was to get our money out of Wall Street banks and into our own banks. And that's the main thing we still want to accomplish. The Bank of North Dakota was formed in 1919 following a farmer's revolt against out-of-state banks for closing on their farms. So um, the the railroad and the greenery and the uh, the banks were all one cartel, the out-of-state banks, and they were uh, not taking the grain. They said it wasn't good grain, but the farmers knew it was good grain, so they thought that they were being uh, discriminated against or that there was an effort to grab their farms. And so that's why they formed a, a political party called the Nonpartisan League and um, got together and formed their own bank and formed their own granary and formed their own uh, mill, I think, which still exists, those three publicly owned things. They were, um, North Dakota was the only state to escape the 2008-2009 credit crisis that's actually when I started writing about it. I knew that they were the only state that had its own bank, but uh, so I was watching it, and <laughs> it did it did remarkably well in the credit crisis. So that's when I started writing, according to the Wall Street Journal. And well, when I first started writing, like the first book I wrote on it was Web of Debt in two thousand seven, published in two thousand seven. At that time, this is considered conspiracy theory that banks, not governments, create our money supply. But in uh, the Wall Street Journal in 2014 actually came out and said it. I'll get to that later. But according to the Wall Street Journal, I'm, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It was the Bank of England that came out and said it. I'm getting ahead of myself. The Wall Street Journal wrote in 2014 that the Bank of North Dakota is more profitable than Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan Chase. And according to the bank's 2022 in a report, which is their latest report, they had record net income of 191 million, record asset size of 10 billion, return on investment of 19%, which is very good. And over the past 35 years, the Bank of North Dakota has returned two thirds of its profits to the state on average. And its return on equity averaged 20% for the first 20 years of of this decade. They also have a taxpayer surplus ranking of number two after Alaska. Why are they so profitable? First of all, they don't have private shareholders sucking out the profits. Uh, they don't pay bonuses, fees, or commissions. They don't have high paid CEOs. They don't have to advertise. And by law, all of the state's revenues are deposited in the bank. So they have a huge deposit bank base and they don't have to advertise for customers either because um, they partner with the local banks. So the local bank actually comes to the Bank of North Dakota when they have a loan that maybe is too big that would have gone to one of the big Wall Street banks. And so they come to the Bank of North Dakota and say, uh, you know, would you like to take half this loan or whatever? So, so that the Bank of North Dakota doesn't initiate these deals and they... Uh, they so and the local bank gets to keep the customer services the customer etc. So so anyway the 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 local banks like the Bank of North Dakota uh, because it, it's so helpful to them. It actually acts as a mini Fed for the state, and then savings are passed on to borrowers and communities. <clears throat> um, and I can't even see. <laughs> anyway, most states in the U.S. have movements attempting to start uh, publicly owned banks, state owned or city owned or county owned, but we don't have any new banks yet in the continental US. We do have America, the Bank of America Samoa, but that's obviously not continental. Um, but now is the time, we would argue, since 2010, 176 public bank bills, studies and resolutions have been filed but the only bank is Bank of America and Samoa. Why is that? We get pushback routinely from private banks and politicians. Politicians particularly are afraid to rock the boat when things are going well. But right now, things are not going so well. And so we would argue now is the time. Uh, they're not going so well for the banks and they're not going so well for the economy. The banks are worried about bank runs, as happened in 
a year ago when Silicon Valley Bank and a couple of other banks, big banks went down. Um, and then interest is very high. So that makes it expensive for the banks for, to acquire liquidity. And it also means that it's harder to find good borrowers since not everybody can pay those high interest rates. And then there's the threat of the derivatives bubble and the commercial real estate bubble, which both could pop and take the banks down. And the economy itself is not doing so well either. The banks aren't lending, and that means that credit is contracting, the money supply is contracting, collaterals require contracting, and this is all considered um, contractionary or recessionary. But public banks don't have that problem. First of all, they don't have to worry about runs because the bank is owned by the government. It's not going to run at itself. It's the major depositor. And they don't have stock, so they, they don't have to worry about short selling. Um, and they can lend more cheaply than, than private banks. So they lend in the public interest. And they can act as a mini Fed for a state, the state as Bank of North Dakota does. Policymakers often say, why do we need publicly owned banks? We already have lots of banks and governments have uh, revolving loan funds. But one major difference is leverage. <laughs> revolving loan funds can lend only the capital that they have. So if they've got, well, anyway, uh, a ch chartered depository bank can lend up to 10 times its capital. <laughs> Private banks can leverage too, of course, but they are costly to borrow from. Banks don't just uh, lend their deposits. They actually create deposits when they make loans, increasing the money supply and GDP. And this was said in 2014 by the Bank of England. They wrote in their quarterly report, banks do not act simply as intermediaries, lending out depositors that savers place with them, and nor do they multiply up central bank money to create new loans and deposits. Commercial banks actually create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. In fact, they said bank deposits make up 97% of the amount of money currently in circulation. So that was the, that was in England or in the UK, 97%. But uh, th this was an article in the um, published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia in 2023, uh, which put the figure at 92% for the first 20 years of this decade. So. And I, I, the quote on the left is the same as the quote on the right, but I couldn't manage to highlight it or expand it, so I, it was a screenshot. So it, they said in their abstract, relying on theories in which bank loans create deposits, a process we call funding liquidity creation, we measure how much funding liquidity the U.S. banking system creates. Private money creation by banks enables lending to not be constrained by the supply of cash deposits. And during the 2001 to 2020 period, 92% of bank deposits were due to funding liquidity creation. And during 2011 to 2020, funding liquidity creation averaged um, 10 trillion a year or 57% of GDP. So if you didn't have banks creating money or fun funding liquidity creation, you would not be able to have created nearly the GDP that we have now. I hear a squeak and I don't know, is that me? <laughs> is that coming from me? I can't tell. There's a funny noise. You don't hear it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so how do they do, how do they create money on their books? Uh, if you go to the, the bank to take out a $500,000 loan, let's say to buy a house, the bank will write it in one side of their books as a liability to themselves because um, when you write your check to your seller, if that seller is another, in another bank, they're going to have to come up with the $500,000 in uh, liquidity and transfer it over to the other bank. And they write it on the other side of their books as an asset to themselves because um, the asset is actually your mortgage, which is backed by your house, um, because you've agreed to pay back that sum over time plus interest. So they say, well, 500000 plus, 500000 minus, it all balances. We haven't really created anything. But across the whole system, all banks are doing this. So if you have two banks, so let's say Bank A lends $500,000 
uh, which becomes, uh, to, you know, for a mortgage, um, which becomes a $500,000 check, which becomes a deposit in Bank B. And Bank B does the same thing, which becomes a $500,000 deposit in Bank A. But this is actually happening all across the banking system. And so over the whole system, you've now got a million dollars in new deposits that didn't exist before. And deposits, of course, are counted in the money supply. And yet both books balance as if they haven't really created anything. But there is a limit to how far <laughs> they can, banks can take this. Banks actually keep two types of accounts. One is uh, with the Fed and it holds reserves with or central bank money. And then they have their own balance sheet where they keep their customer deposits. So reserves consist of cash, coin, and digital reserves, which are created by the bank, or sorry, by the Federal Reserve, and they're acquired from the Fed and they're needed for interbank settlements. You can't you can't get your money out of the bank except through these reserves. So if you pull, like say you go to take out cash, they will give you cash. That's part of their cash or reserves. That's in their vault, it's called vault cash. Or if you want um, to transfer money to another bank, then they have to use the digital reserves in their reserve account with the Fed. Banks consider deposits to be liabilities on their books and they create commercial bank money when they make loans, but um, they need the federal the reserves in the Federal Reserve account to settle checks paid to other banks. Only the Fed can create reserves and only institutions with master accounts with the Fed can have reserve accounts. So that's one challenge we have is getting a master account. The, the Bank of North Dakota has a master account with the Fed. They're not a member of the Federal Reserve, but they have a master account and therefore they can participate in the whole banking system. Um, contrary to popular belief, the Federal Reserve does not print money and neither does the Treasury. Uh, this is a famous picture of, of um, our Federal Reserve chairman allegedly printing money. Uh, in fact, the Fed buys coins from the mint at face value. So, so if the mint makes a 25 cent cent coin and it costs 15 cents for the metal etc to make the coin then the mint gets the seniorage they get the 10 cent difference but with paper currency the fed buys it from the bureau of engraving and printing at cost so that means if it costs 10 cents to print a hundred dollar bill then the fed will send sell the bill to commercial banks for a hundred dollars but they only have to pay the 10 cents for the printing. So they obviously get the seniorage on the paper currency. And they sell both to banks at face value, but they return most of their profits, about 95% of their profits to the treasury. So for that reason, it's actually good for us when the Fed buys federal debt, for example, because they return the interest to the treasury. So what the Fed creates are not dollars, but digital bank reserves the things that you have to have to transfer funds from one bank to another. Reserves enter the money supply when the Fed buys securities with them from banks or on the open market. So say the bank needs to acquire some reserves to back up its loans. Um, and it's got some, say, federal securities, then it sells those to the Fed. Fed buys the securities with, with the with its with reserves putting it putting the reserves in the reserve account of the of the bank and the treasury doesn't print dollars either this that picture is a little misleading because it's really uh was when janet yellen was head of the fed but uh <laughs> we can pretend it i mean she's now head of the treasury so a lot of people you, you see things on the internet or whatever. Well, if the Fed can print money or if the Treasury can print money, why does it borrow that sort of thing? But anyway, the Treasury, actually it could, it could issue money constitutionally. The, the constitution says Congress shall coin money and regulate the value thereof. And different experts have said, yep, it would be legal if they wanted to create a trillion dollar coin and put it in their bank account and write checks against that they could do it. But they don't because everybody thinks it would be inflationary. Now, I've written on this and I would argue you could do that over time and it wouldn't be inflationary to pay off the 
uh, federal debt, but I mean, I can go into that if anybody cares, but it's not directly relevant here. <laughs> Um, um, but what the Treasury issues are debt. So it's securities, bills, bonds, and notes. And um, the, they can't just, people think that the Treasury just takes the bonds over to the Fed and says, here, monetize this, turn this into dollars so I can spend it. But the, the Fed is not allowed to um, lend directly to the Treasury. The Fed has to buy the securities on the open market like everybody else if it wants to. And so at the moment, it's not buying, it's actually selling, even though obviously the treasurer would, would like them to buy now because they've got the Chinese selling, et cetera. But the Federal Reserve is selling um, uh, bonds or federal securities in order to allegedly tighten the money supply because when it sells, then it pulls back um, reserves. That's how it does it. You know, everything's in the reserve reserve accounts of the banks. So the bank buys the security and the Fed gets its reserves back. <laughs> Can I read my caption? But anyway, it's the actually the commercial banks that, oh, I know what that was. Uh, so uh, some people say, why if the Fed can, or if the Treasury or the Fed can print money, why why do they borrow? And I saw this really good argument in uh, it was Martin Armstrong, who was an economist, and he said, well, the, the thought, the original thought was that loans are non-inflationary because they go out and they have to be paid back, so it's a closed circuit. So you've got a finite amount of money in the system. But today, the Treasury doesn't repay the debt. It just accumulates. It gets more and more and more. And the interest is now up to a trillion dollars. It's actually pa it's past defense and past Medicare. Uh, it's eating up the budget. So he argued that we would actually be better off if they did just issue it directly instead of borrowing it. So I thought that was a good argument. <clears throat> um, so it's really the commercial banks that create the money that we deal with and they create it as loans. But at the moment, they are not making nearly as many loans. Uh, the $105 billion in uh, loans in 2024, has, or, you know, there's been that much uh, drop in loans. Uh, they're tightening lending standards, partly because they're worried about runs and partly because it's hard to find borrowers who can pay, like you don't wanna get subprime borrowers. The reason there were so many subprime borrowers was that they could lend at like almost nothing back when the interest rates were really low, but they're so high now, it's hard to find qualified borrowers. And then, so the fear that this is the fear of uh, bank runs uh, again, reserves are required to meet withdrawals, and they're you can they get the reserves from incoming deposits because when the deposits are transferred over, the reserves are transferred over as well, or by borrowing from other banks on the Fed funds market, or the from the Fed directly, like at the discount window or on the money market, and all those deposits go into a pool, and when people come to pull out. I mean, sorry, all those reserves go into a pool or when people come to pull their money out, the reserves go. Oh, you want to it? Hmm. No, you can have it all. Oh. Thank you. Go with the withdrawals. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so for hundreds of years, a 10% reserve requirement has been considered adequate that the bank could lend out 90% of its reserves. And... Uh, and this was based on the experience of the goldsmiths back in the 17th century, where they they would hold people's gold for safekeeping and give them these little gold certificates, paper certificates, uh, which showed that they had that amount of gold in the in the um, vaults of the goldsmith. And they discovered that people preferred to trade the paper notes rather than trading the actual gold or you know, carrying the gold around because it was heavy, it was dangerous to carry around. The paper was very convenient. So 90% of the uh, gold was left there in their vaults. And so they realized they could lend out 
um, 10 times as many paper notes as they actually had gold and get away with it. And so that was that 10% reserve requirement has held ever since, although at the moment there's no reserve requirement because the Fed withdrew it in 2020 with the COVID crisis. But banks, even so, banks know that they have to keep it about 10% in reserve. And as long as everybody trusts the banks and things go along stably, 10% is fine. But if more than 10% of the depositors try to pull out their money at once, then it can trigger a bank run. And that is what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. So its depositors were largely venture capital funded tech startups. So they didn't need loans. They already had the money. They just wanted a place to park their deposits. So Silicon Valley Bank had a lot of excess reserves over its 10% reserve requirement, or I think it was actually lower than, but, um, and they used those reserves to buy long-term government bonds because at the time interest rates were so low that they couldn't really make anything on short-term bonds. So they bought the long-term ones, but the problem was that now that interest rates have shot way up, nobody wants the long-term bonds because they don't pay very much. They'd much rather buy the the new bonds that are paying more. So Silicon Valley Bank, if they tried to sell their bonds, they would have to sell them at a discount so they wouldn't have, uh, you know, they wouldn't get most of their money out. Plus a lot of their bonds were marked um, hold to maturity. So they couldn't, legally, they couldn't sell them anyway. So they were stuck with these bonds that weren't worth much. And over the course of three days, uh, depositors attempted to pull out 85% of their deposits, uh, which was more than any bank would be able to withstand. And the reason was that uh, there was a, a run on the, or uh, sorry, there was a, a an attack by short sellers, a massive attack that looked like a coordinated attack to bring the, the stock. And then the, the customer, the depositors, somebody noticed that, I guess, and it went into uh, social media. And then all the depositors knew that the bank was risky and they all rushed to pull their money out at once. And apparently the reason for the the massive short selling was that Silicon Valley Bank was a crypto bank and the government has an agency that was opposed to crypto. They didn't want, they didn't want uh, the deposits, you know, leaving the conventional banking system and going into the crypto system so so they went after it well it's i mean i don't want to say it was politically motivated but at least there was that it was known that that um, the government was not happy with these banks so most most there's at least 200 banks that also have a lot of these um bonds on their books that they can't sell so they're in a similar position as Silicon Valley Bank, but they seem to be safe. No, they, there's no short selling attempt on those banks because nobody has precipitated it. Uh, most state governments or city governments put their money in big Wall Street banks, but it's uh, they're thinking that these are you know too big to fail and they're the safe banks, but they are no longer too, too big. I mean, they're too big to fail, but it doesn't mean that we, the depositors, are safe. Uh, one reason is there's two quadrillion dollars. Nobody knows exactly, but it is estimated that there's two quadrillion dollars in derivatives out there, a huge bubble that could pop. Uh, and in the, in the great financial, well, anyway, in 2008, 2009, uh, derivatives did set off that crisis. And uh, you know, and in 2010, the Dodd Frank Act. Uh, well, it was Obama said, "No more good news, no more bailouts." You know that we, the taxpayers, would no longer be bailing out these banks if they failed. But the reason was that the Dodd Frank said that instead we would do bail-ins, which is what we saw in Cyprus when the Cyprus banks went down, and that means that. The bank is required, if it goes bankrupt, to to um, to turn its creditors 
uh, money into capital, capitalize its um, capitalize its debt, basically. So we, the people, only would get a share in a bankrupt bank, and that is what happened in Cyprus. And I, I know there was, you know, it was a great upset. <laughs> it wasn't a, people weren't too happy with that model. And that would also happen to the state banks. Well, I'll get to that later. But so the the biggest derivative banks are Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. So I'm going to talk about J.P. Morgan Chase later. Later, but you can see it's got over fifty trillion dollars in derivatives. Uh, Warren Buffett called derivatives weapons of mass destruction. A quadrillion dollars is 10 times global GDP and three times collective world wealth. So that's far more money than anybody has in the world. And there are a number of black swan events, uh, you know, unexpected crises that could set off the derivatives bomb, including war, excessive interest rates, commercial real estate crisis, or the federal debt, which is inching up toward $35 trillion. Uh, it was credit derivatives that helped trigger the last collapse, but today it's interest rate derivatives that dominate the market and are the riskiest. Derivatives originally served as a form of insurance to protect farmers and other producers from price changes. So this is called hedging and it's considered socially valuable. I mean, if you actually own something that you're protecting by buying this derivative as insurance, you're, it's a bet. It's really just gambling, but you're betting that the price will, to, you're betting against the price going down in order to maintain a certain price. And then the counterparty to your bet bets that it's going to go up, basically. One party is going <laughs> to make out and the other party is going to lose. But before 2000, speculative derivatives were no, neither player had an economic interest in the under un, underlying you know whatever the bet was on were unenforceable so it, it, you could do it you could bet like um you could go to the racetrack even though you didn't own a horse and you could bet on the horses but if you didn't if you weren't paid and you thought you were owed money you couldn't take it to court it was not an enforceable contract but then in 2000, Congress passed the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, which allowed court enforcement of speculative derivatives. And that's where they took off. The market just took off. So today, uh, as set out in a work a book called The Great Taking by David Rogers Webb, uh, derivatives and repo are... Uh, Actually, they're called the protected class, and they get to go first in a bankruptcy. They have super priority. So if the bank goes bankrupt, even before, typically it would be the FDIC that would be um, um, regulate or would be overseeing this bankruptcy. But before the bankruptcy proceedings even begin, uh, the derivatives claimants can grab their money, pull their money out of the bankrupt bank. That used to be considered a fraudulent uh, transfer right before a bankruptcy, but today it's actually legal and there's nothing they can do about it. So if you had something like J.P. Morgan Chase with 50 trillion in derivatives, if all those claimants grab their derivatives, um, they would it would wipe out everything J.P. Morgan Chase had, including the even the secured creditors, which the state and local governments think they're secured, but they're still junior to the derivatives and repo. And these re regulations are set out in the Bankruptcy Act of 2005 and UCC Sections 8 and 9 and the Dodd-Frank Act. I, I thought this was just a, a good summary of what, oh, if this is also true if a... Um, if a broker goes bankrupt, they can take your stock because people think the stock's in their name, but it's not. Stock is held in street name. And ultimately, the ultimate owner of the stock is a financial transaction. Uh, sorry, the FTCC, which is the, uh, oh, shoot. <laughs> anyway, it's the top of the, the, what is it? The financial, uh, I forget what TCC stands for. 
Anyway, clear, Clearing Corporation, Financial Transaction Clearing Corporation, I think. Anyway, they own everything in the name of their nominee seed and company. And they do that. They actually, there was a reason that it got set up that way 50 years ago when they had to trot between brokers to trade paper stock. But now with computerization, there's no reason they couldn't put it in our own name. But they like keeping it in street name because that means they can sell stock to short sellers and they do a lot of that and they can rehypothecate. And we, the real owners, don't know that's happening and they're doing it against our interests and they're not paying any part of the benefit. But anyway, so this was a Wall Street financial analyst named John Rabino. And he said on this podcast, he said, what we used to think of as, as a bank bail-in where they take your deposit in order to support a failing bank. I mean, that was under Dodd-Frank. That is now spread across the entire financial economy where whatever you have in an account anywhere can just disappear because they're going to transfer ownership of it to these big dominant entities out there in the financial system that need those assets in order to keep from blowing up. In other words, the reason they're protected is that they're so risky. Well, the real solution is obviously not to protect them, but to change the laws. We should, but I don't know that that's going to happen. Meanwhile, anyway, the point is that these big derivative banks are actually very risky, even though they're considered too big to fail. I mean, that they're, you know, safe. They can, they can fail. And if they fail, we are going to, we that, it's not going to be we the taxpayers that fail them out. It's going to be we, the investors or the depositors in those institutions. So compare JP Morgan Chase and Bank of North Dakota. Chase has deposits of over $2 trillion and over half of them are uninsured, or sorry, over a trillion. So actually more than half are insured and the deposit insurance fund only has $116 billion in it. So that's only 5% of all the JP Morgan deposits. So obviously they're not going to bail us all out if there's a big derivative bust. Um, and they have 50 trillion in derivatives and it, it, it netted derivatives, I won't even try to explain what that is, but they had five times as many netted derivatives as Credit Suisse, which was another systemically important financial institution in Switzerland that went bankrupt in 2020. So um, JP Morgan, and that was a major reason they went bankrupt. So JP Morgan is vulnerable. Where it compared to Bank of North Dakota, there's no risk of bank runs because the state owns the bank. It's not going to run on itself. It doesn't have private shareholders who can short sell the stock. They have a captive capital and deposit base. They have an A-plus credit rating. And uh, North Dakota has the fastest growing GDP per capita in, of any state. Uh, this, these are just two to a podcast I saw that were on that one guy said, Bank of North Dakota, America's safest bank. That's what he was talking about. And the other one was, oops, sorry. The other was Kevin O'Leary and he was says, North Dakota public bank shows success over regional banks. There is an incredible situation unfolding here. And he just said how, how, uh, how, uh, talked about the Bank of North Dakota. Mm, I can't even read my own caption. Uh, so there, anyway, there are other advantages to the Bank of North Dakota besides those, besides being safe. It uh, partners, not competes with the local banks, so it helps them with liquidity, capitalization, regulation. It buys community bank loans to provide liquidity in a crisis or takes a partnership interest in them and guarantees them. It provides correspondent banking services, an active Fed funds program, check clearing, cash management services, loan guarantees, and other bank bankers bank services. So acting as a mini Fed for the state. And um, North Dakota distributed unemployment benefits through community banks coordinated by the B Bank of North Dakota 10 times faster than the slowest state. And small businesses in North Dakota secured more paycheck protection program funds per worker than any other state. Uh, public banks lend counter cyclically. So when the commercial banks are pulling ba back from lending, they're afraid to lend, the public bank rushes in 
uh, Eric Hardemeyer, who was uh, CEO of the Bank of North Dakota for many years, passed away recently, rest in peace. Um, <clears throat> but he said that uh, where it's like when most people run away from the a fire, the firemen rush, rush it in, and that's what the Bank of North Dakota does. So they did that with the when they had several floods where they rushed in and rescued the, you know, the fin financially rebuilt the city, et cetera. So in this chart, it comes from the uh, December, it comes from 2008, 2009 period. And it's mostly about uh, South American, Central and South American banks, which they have a lot of public banks, but um, when the private banks were withdrawing their loans or, reducing their loans, the public banks were expanding their loans. And a public bank can lend to qualifying local businesses at cost. Uh, they don't have private shareholders extracting profits. They had the most local banks per capita of any state. Nationally, uh, community banks have shrunk from over 8,000 to about 5,000 just in 15 years leaving banking deserts, whole communities without banks. But that's not true in North Dakota. North Dakota has six times the national average in banks per capita uh, because the Bank of North Dakota partners with them and basically keeps them solvent, augmenting available capital and liquidity and alleviating risk. <clears throat> um, hmm, I don't know what that said either. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, states are you it's usually up to the states to do infrastructure, but they have budget shortfalls. So when they don't have enough money, they borrow in the private bond market, typically. Uh, and with a 30 year infrastructure loan, it's just like a 30 year mortgage interest and fees can be half the cost of infrastructure. It can be more than half, depending on the interest rate. In 2020, across the whole country, local governments paid $160 billion just in interest. And fees go to big private banks and profits go to wealthy private bondholders that are largely out of state. So money is being siphoned out of the local economy rather than adding to it. And this example on the right is the Bay Bridge, which uh, we, the taxpayers, were told that it was going to be um, $6 billion dollars but it turned out to be a 12 billion, or this is just a portion of the bridge, but turned out to be 12 billion after you added in the interest. Uh, bond underwriting is also expensive. Uh, according to Moody's, municipal bond default rate was almost nothing up till 2012 uh, versus 3.6% for corporate bonds. And yet, the municipal bonds have to jump through a lot more hoops in order to get certified and to qualify for the bonds. And the bond under, underwriters are not even the people that we necessarily want to be getting our money. They've been caught in collusion, bid rigging, bad swap. This, these are big Wall Street banks, typically. Uh, bad swap advice. Uh, nearly $2 billion in fines and fees have been paid since 2000 by those big banks. Um, so, so some cities and states, municipal governments are already borrowing directly from banks. And, you know, we would say they should borrow from their own public bank. But anyway, according to Moody's, 20% of new municipal borrowings are direct loans from private banks. The advantage are, advantages are the, uh, the interest rates are lower. There are fewer regulatory hurdles, lower transaction costs. You can avoid the fees for rating agencies, credit enhancements, bond trustees, and their attorneys. No need for voter approval. Uh, no need to pay interest on the bonds over 30 years. So if you take out an something for infrastructure, like this Bay Bridge thing, let's say that it was a 30-year loan, you're going to be paying interest over that whole period. Whereas if you have a credit line with a bank, you can just draw what you need for right now. Like you need to build this portion of the bill bridge or whatever, and you need X amount of money. So you're only paying interest on that short term, that shorter term loan. Uh, new money is created as credit for the local economy. And of course, it would be even better if they borrowed from their own public banks. It would be cheaper and they would get the profits themselves. 
So this is a summary uh, of why um, <clears throat> can't read my, my own thing but anyway why why it's better to have a have a public bank why a, a depository bank can do more than a revolving loan fund most most states do have revolving loan funds that deal with a lot of things that we want our public bank to do but the depository bank can just do it better and can do more they can leverage the capital at 10 to 1 uh for liquidity, they can borrow from depositors, typically the, their own revenues, the Fed or uh, Fed funds from other banks. At today's rates, incoming deposits are the cheapest source of liquidity. The local governments can borrow from their own banks, saving on bond fees and interest, and then other advantages. They increase the local money supply and local access to credit, provide a mini Fed for local banks and the local economy, lend when private banks aren't lending, and rush financial aid in emergencies. This is just a chart we have on our Public Banking Institute website for, um, comparing uh, different forms of financial institutions, which is quite informative. I think it's but I mean, I'm not going to read it. But anyway, if you have any interest, it's on our website. And there is our website, publicbankinginstitute.org. And my website is at ellenbrown.com. And these are my three books on the subject. And that's all I have. And I have no idea what time it is. Well, thank you, Ellen. That was extremely afford and informative. Uh, tons of great information. Uh, uh, from you and your slides. We're now in the question and answer period of it. What I'm going to ask, if you want to ask a question, just use an icon to raise your hand. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the raised hand feature. Um, so you can raise your hand. I will call on people in order that I'm seeing them. If you don't want to use the raise the hand feature, you can just put in the chat. Uh, you can put a question and I'll know to call on you as such. All right. So we do have the time for question and answer. So if anybody would uh, like to do it, the floor is open. Oh, I do see someone wrote in the chat, uh, sort of a comment slash question from KG. KG, did you want to share your, your comment slash question with the group? Oops. Um, unfortunately, I, I have to run out the door and rejoin by phone in a, a few a minute. But I, I realize this is what you're deal, doing is wonderful, and it's different than what my question is. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I thought as people who are very interested in social good and banks that you might have a thought on my question, and you can see what it says there. Maybe you can read it out loud. Uh, so it says, uh, I appreciate what you're doing. On a different note, is there a bank or credit on earth that does not invest in or give loans to enterprises that torment animals? Even the so-called yeah. value-based banks finance cruelty to animals. Oh, wow. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. I don't really know what all banks do. But the thing is, if you set up a public bank and you have, ideally, you would have some sort of an advisory, citizen's advisory on what they can do or what they're or, and you could have that kind of input and say, we want the bank to not do X, Y, Z. That's the one major advantage of having the bank in the hands of the public. I do see a hand raised from Ingrid. Ingrid, go ahead, you have the floor. Hi, Ellen. Um, good to see you again. I, I'm curious about the Dakota, North Dakota Bank, because you said that it's got all this money, um, or that's how I'm understanding it. How did it get to be so big? And who is investing in that bank? And 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 is North Dakota, or, or is that population pretty much set if there should be any kind of recession or whatever. I mean, if you can explain that a little better, because it seems like the most successful state bank at this point. Right. Well, uh, of course, it's been in business for over a century. But um, 
they by law all the state's revenues are deposited in the bank and i'm i'm not sure what the, they have in the way of revenues but i know in california here the uh there are 200 billion dollars in the uh, treasurer's investment pool i mean we have a lot of money that could theoretically be put in our own state bank if the government if the state government were to trust us to do it that's the problem it's hard to i mean we've had I think we counted four bills already to attempt to get the government to do it, or, or three at least, and they, they haven't done that. So, but so it's basically all those revenues, and then you could you could create loans out of that, and then you get the profits from the loans. So you're leveraging your your um your capital. So it's not from bonds then necessarily, it's from the revenue that like income tax revenue and sales tax revenue, that kind of that kind of in, income. Oh, it's yeah. The the re, the state's revenues are right. Yeah, from taxes and fees, that sort of thing. Okay, and that's and that's making more money than a regular bank. Then it sounds like. Well, if you if a bank actually had two hundred billion dollars, like in California to play with, yeah, they could make, uh, well, let's say, if those are the reserves, they could make certainly, well, technically they could make 10 times that. I mean, that's not capital, but they have to keep 10%. If they kept that as their 10% reserve, they could make um, 200 billion. So 2 trillion in loans, I suppose, and they'd get the interest on all those loans. So that's that's where the profits come from. And then next up, I see Sarah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the in-depth presentation, Ellen. Um, I'm representing Senator uh, Bob Hasegawa. I work um, as his executive legislative office manager at our office. Um, my question is concerning uh, the uh, the uh, your institute. Whether um, in the beginning you showed us the global uh, map of all the state banks uh, throughout the world. Um, I'm from Tokyo, Japan, and uh, when I went to your website, I recall seeing only one public bank under Japan. We actually have six that I know of, and possibly more. Um, uh, smaller ones. And I wonder if you have any in-depth uh, global studies um, and just taking in, you know, best practices from other countries, including Japan, uh, well, that, that might be emulated in Washington state. That, that world bank, uh, that world map was taken from a book which talks about such things. So I, I can send you the link to the book. I don't have it right now, but if you want to mm, send me your, I love Bob Hasegawa. I tell him hello. <laughs> yeah, I will do that. Yeah, he sends you best regards. Yeah. So thank you. He's, he and wrote it... the first ever state bank bill, which was in 2010, before we even formed the Public Banking Institute. It was great. <laughs> He's working on yeah. another one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I can, I can send you the, that book, it's a professor who's in Canada and he's researched it like crazy. Um, and the one I've written about is that um, the the Japan Post Bank, which at one time that's right. yeah. was the largest depository bank in the world and it was public publicly owned. And it, um, it was called Japan's second budget because everybody put their money in the postal bank. I mean, I think postal bank is a great, I, idea. I didn't really talk about all the history in our, of banking, uh, public banking in the U.S., but postal banking was one. We actually had a postal banking system, but not that big. But what they did was that the Japan Post Bank would inve invest all those deposits or, you know, whatever their excess liquidity um, in government bonds. And so that was the, the backup liquidity source for the I forget what you call your Ministry of Finance. Yeah. I, I just wonder if there's any legislative nexus for our legislators to do, you know, trips abroad and just learn from some other practices. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. 
but I can, I can send you that book. <laughs> I'll have to. If you can, you send. If you put your email address down there, I could save the chat and then I can send it sure, to you. Sure, we'll do that. Thank you. Okay, and we have we have two other comments slash questions that are in the chat. So one is from Ruth. Ruth, do you want to read your 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 comment and question? Can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Um, I remember vaguely that the banks restructured themselves, the big ones like JP, JP Morgan and so on, so that they weren't true investment banks or they split off uh, where one uh, part of the bank would remain an investment bank, but the other one would be slightly different so they could kind of avoid accountability. Do you know if that's something that happened? I, I was just curious. As I keep thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that yeah, they all have, you know, ever since um, ever since Glass did that part of Glass Steagall was rep uh, repealed, they do that. They're capable of doing that. And the the ones that were only investment banks started having depository arms so that they could get the advantages of being a depository bank, which <laughs> again was very risky. Yeah. Okay, that's what I'm thinking about. Thank you. And then I have Martha next. Yeah. And mine is, um, you know, how likely is it for a bill to move forward in the next session, our next legislative session? I mean, to, to me, it makes enormous sense for us to have a state bank and to keep our money in the state and to use it here instead of giving money to folks and wealthy folks in the East Coast and wherever. I mean... I think that's a question for Marco. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I guess I, I could report on some of the progress that we've made so far. So we have met with Bob Hasegawa. Uh, yeah. We have another meeting with his um, office again uh, in uh, next week. Um, we do, we're planning to meet with State Senator Yasmin Trudeau. And then uh, we are waiting to hear back from Marco Lilas. So we have some uh, legislators who we've reached out to that are responding to us, meet with them. Uh, our organization, Washingtonians for Public Banking, has created a draft bill that we share with Bob Hasegawa, and I know he's um, sharing it with the staff to get feedback on. And we are, um, I was saving it for the end to, to remind everyone, uh, but it, now is an appropriate time to tell everyone, we are having a coalition meeting next month on June 26th, that's going to be like this, it's going to be over Zoom, where we're going to go over the contents of our bill and talk about our strategy upcoming for the legislative session. Then we'll have another meeting in December um, to prepare everyone for um, lobbying and getting ready to put pressure on our legislators. So we are seeing some movement. We have been trying this year, trying to get some local municipalities, city governments to pass resolutions in support of public banking. So far, there's only one city in Washington that has passed resolution in support of public banking, that's, that's Bellingham. Uh, I have been in contact with uh, representatives in Olympia, and I think we have about four people on the council who are interested, but we can't get it on the agenda because the mayor is just not uh, interested and doesn't seem to be a big priority for people. Um, but we really want to try to get some of the local governments on board and make statements so they know they're committed to the cause as well. So if you know people in Olympia, uh, they can put pressure on their city council members, especially on the mayor, to add it to the agenda. That would really be a big help for our cause and moving forward. But we want to also do it here in uh, Pierce County and Tacoma, King County, um, Spokane, move into a lot of areas to get their support before the next legislative session. Um, I do think, feel confident, even if we don't get something passed this next legislative session, that we're going to have a big splash, much, much larger splash than we have in the past because our organization has put a lot of effort in trying to mobilize support from these types of measures. So I hope well, that answers your question, Martha. No, it, it sort of does, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. We as individuals need to be talking to our own representatives and senators. Senator Hasegawa is my senator, mm -hmm. fortunately for me. Um, anyway, you know, legislators respond to what their constituents want and Ordinary folks like us are the ones that are going to make the difference in the long run. It's not going to be your, I appreciate what your organization does, but it's not going to be your organization that makes it happen. If you don't get ordinary folks out there 
talking to their legislators, it's not going to happen. Oh, I, I would just say I, I agree. I really think it's really important to make sure that all the um, uh, uh, organization, uh, people like yourself are reaching out to legislators. That's part of our strategy as well. Uh, we have tried to build a coalition of a lot of organizations throughout the state that are, are trying to raise this issue as well to try to get into pressure moving from the ground up to to um, contact your legislators about it. The other way I would suggest is is that if there are, well, we've got let we've got to have elections coming up in the fall. Go out and talk to legislators when they're running for office and ask them the question: Hey, is this something you support? Are you mm -hmm. going to support a state bank for the for, for Washington? Because you're going to get a lot of other people that are going to hear you ask the question, and then they're going to want to know about it, and that's part of it also. So. I I also want to second that. I do know there are several people running this uh, legis uh, for legislator who are making an issue of public bank or part of the agenda. And we do we are planning to issue a questionnaire to um, candidates that we can give the results over to the people who are um, our supporters so they can be informed about who to support in the upcoming election. OK. Yeah, uh, I do have Ingrid's hand up. Hi, um, you know what I've. I have found out, and that's same with the National Infrastructure Bank, is that that the we're not getting it out to the people. People are not being educated. So they can't, so they don't even know about it to ask their legislators. And I I don't know what the solution is okay. except for getting, you know, maybe on on some podcast or uh, uh some kind of, you know. Sunday morning programs or whatever the program is that we could get it out nationally. And I think really the po the point is, is that people just don't even know what the, that it's out there, uh, what we're doing and what is it, you know, so that they could say to the, their representatives, this is what we want. You know, I think everybody that's working on these banks that, that are working really hard and they're grassroots and they're calling they're calling the legislators they're calling the representatives the senators every everywhere and even in the national in the democratic national um uh or national conference or the election what it the i don't know what it's called dnc i guess um they even want to put a spot out there uh for it too but i i really think it's just I I don't know. I don't have a solution. I'm just saying that that's what I think is is the biggest problem because all of the people that know about this bank and know about the other banks that are out there are out there telling the people involved and who we want to, you know, we're all doing that. It's just we got to get it out there, you know, more. I, I don't know what to tell you, but I really think that's the problem is people just don't know what it is. And they don't understand the history of these banks and how they work. So um, that's my thought. Anybody else want to chime in? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and I do want to know, we do have someone else in chat. Akisha, you're, you are you made a comment in chat. I want to make sure we give time to you as well. I think she's gone. Oh. Uh, Maybe she left. Yeah, maybe there's a comment on her way out. Yes, it looks like she left. All right. Well, uh, we are over the hour. Um, so, so if anyone, unless anyone has any other final co comments. Oh, Pam, go ahead. Oh, hi. Thanks. Um, I'm pretty new to this, but I just wondered about... Um, uh, I went to school in Kansas. I um, am involved in some of the Native Indian affairs here in the state as, as well. And how does all that, the federal money that farmers get and uh, tribal members get, um, does that go into the, the uh, public bank and utilize within the state? Or is that, am I thinking wrong? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, there are actually tribal banks in the yeah. U.S. We own tribal banks. So I would assume that if North Dakota had such a bank, it would go in the tribal bank and okay. not in North Dakota. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Oh, but okay. I don't know. Okay. 
and on that, I uh, I'm going to close out this session. I want to thank everyone again for coming. We are do post these on our YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and listen to it again, or you want to share this with someone who you also be interested, check out our YouTube channel. It should be posted up sometime next week. I also want to remind people uh, one more time that um, we are having our coalition meeting in June 26 at six o'clock, also virtually. If you're signed up on our newsletter, you will get regular updates about that um, to make sure to sign up for it. And, I, and of course, I want to thank our speaker, Ellen uh, Brown, for um, sharing the information and sharing her time with us. I think we all found it extremely informative. <laughs> Thank right. you. Bye, and good so thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, good, and good hopefully, I was. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ellen. And good luck with your new bill. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marco. Bye, Marco.